اتفضل دقيقتين السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد أشرف خلق الله أجمعين سبحانك ربنا هديتنا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله رب العالمين جزيل الشكر والتقدير للأستاذ الدكتور خالد مغرب بتفضله بوقته الثمين وجهده وتفضل علينا وبإذن الله بمحاضرة تكون استثنائية about ARDS mechanical ventilation in ARDS or the ventilation management in ARDS from the basic to the update and guidelines many thanks and I am so pleased and so honored to have him today my great pleasure and honor to have to have Professor Dr. Ahmed Mahdi as a moderator for our scientific committee today Welcome, Dr. Ahmed. Welcome, Dr. Khalid. God bless you. We don't want to talk to you ever again. In the end, the day of the day is a great day. Thank you very much for your presentation. Dr. Ahmed, welcome to Dr. Khalid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. والصلاة والسلام على اشرف المرسلين وسيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. كل الشكر طبعا دكتوره صفاء. ثانك يو سو ماتش فور دكتوره صفاء هلال. يعني اي ام ريلي امبريسد وذ هير ليت اس سي اوت ستاندنج اكتيفيتي. شي از ريلي هيرويك. شي از ريلي هايلي اكتيف ان ذا ايديوكيشنال تريننج. اند ان شاء الله يجعلوه في ميزان حسناتها وميزان حسنات الجميع باذن الله ان شاء الله. شكرا جزيلا دكتوره صفاء. ات از ماي بليجر اكشولي تو برزنت يعني كان اي سي ماي سينيور كونسلتنتس فروم داي 1 ايم هير ان سعودي اريبيا سينس لونج تايم باك دكتور خالد مغربي هو واز ماي كونسلتنتس ان ماي اريا اي واز ات ذات تايم سينيور ستار اند فيلو اند باي ذا واي هو از ماي اكزامينر اولسو ان ذا فيلوشيب بروجرام دكتور خالد المغربي وان فروم ذا ايمينت انتنسيفست ان ذا كينجدوم اند اون اول ميد ايست اي كان سي اهلا بيك دكتور خالد اي جاست جيف مي بريف جاست تو شو يو تو تيل ذيم اباوت يو يعني بريفلي فروم ماي اون اي دونت هاف اني بيبر اور سي في فور يو Uh, I'm really delighted to present, I can say one from the uh, founder of the uh, residency program in the Kingdom since 2015. Uh, and uh, he has two, two subspecialties. He's eminent in both, yeah, internal medicine subspeciality and, specialty and intensive care. Dr. Khalid is examiner also in the Saudi Commission for Healthcare Specialist for Internal Medicine. And he was director of the program in King Faisal Specialist Hospital a long time back. And he's now on the uh, as ICU consultant in King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center, one from the let's say class A in the uh, in the Middle East of the hospitals and the research center in the worldwide. Uh, Dr. Khaled Maghrabi, of course, he passed all the uh, residence program, fellowship program in uh, King Faisal as well as in Ottawa in, in intensive care, as well as also Arab board long time back. Uh, he's has a lot of interest in the ICU, and he's uh, examiner, of course, of the Saudi board, as well as Saudi fellowship program and the Saudi, Saudi uh, Commission for Healthcare Specialist. He's the one also of the uh, big, let us say, uh, founder also, I was, uh, uh, let us say, he's uh, in establishing the Saudi Critical Care Society in the kingdom. Uh, really, his, his activity in the education is not only, uh, not limited to Saudi, Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia, but also expanded a lot he has a lot of uh, activity in uh, Gulf countries, in Sudan, in Jordan, in Egypt. Really, I'm, I, I have, I am proud to be uh, his uh, 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 fellow at, at one time before, long time. Dr. Khaled Maghrabi, thank you so much. And he will talk with us today about one from the very, let us say, hot and the common topic in all ICUs worldwide. All of us knows acute respiratory stress syndrome. It is a, a, a hot and the big topic in all in ICUs worldwide. يعني usually ice use between sepsis and ARDS. For ARDS, one for the big topic and the debating a lot, lot of researches, lot of trials, lot of guidelines talk about it. I think he will take us in a, a very, uh, uh, let us say, uh, a journey of ARDS from basic until ventilatory support, literature, evidence-based guidelines. Inshallah, I'm expecting a lot as usual uh, from my senior consultant, Dr. Khalid. Uh, kindly for all the attendees, uh, it is really official uh, talk, but feel free to write your questions in between. Just drop it in the chat room at any time. 
I will deliver to Dr. Khalid and we will try even to have like in between the session, we have like some break kind of to discuss with him the questions you will, you will deliver in the chat room. Uh, feel free to drop all your questions in the chat room. Thank you so much and welcome. And uh, Dr. Khalid. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Masar khair. Ahmed, thank you very much in uh, illustrating how old am I compared to you. Uh, and uh, I'm really pleased and glad uh, to be with you tonight. Uh, thank uh, a lot of thanks for Dr. Uh, Safa Hilal for uh, her invitation and give me this chance. Actually, uh, uh, talking about ERDS uh, mechanical ventilation, I thought it is uh, the bread and butter of uh, critical care medicine. And anybody in critical care medicine, probably among the first thing that we learned is how to ventilate patient uh, with hypoxemic respiratory failure and basically a patient with uh, ARDS. But uh, uh, what I'm going to do, we will have a quick review for the important points and I'm trying to link things together. And my main aim is to uh, link the basic with, with the clinical. So as intensivists and people treating uh, ARDS patient, we have to understand why we are doing things so we can uh, do it rightly and we understand the rationale of uh, uh, what we are doing. Uh, I'm trying just to share. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen. Not yet, Dr. Khaled, you can try again. Yeah, but... Uh, is not connected with. Technology, we tried it earlier before, but if you give me a few seconds to I'll take your time. What we can do. I'm not sure if I was enabled to share. Can it should please? Uh, you are co-host. You are co-host, Dr. Khalil, on the screen. Okay. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. So. Okay. okay. I think uh, we're set, but let me take this one away. Yes. From. Now it is clear. Dr. Khalil. So, uh, Bismillah. So, we'll talk about multiple aspects in the management and mechanical ventilation or ventilation in the ERDS. And my talk will be limited only the aspect of mechanical ventilation. I'm not going to talk about other uh, non ventilatory support. I uh, would not talk about other things. And many of the things that probably you hear, you did hear it before, but we try to link things uh, together. And uh, uh, as Ahmed mentioned, maybe later on you can post your question. One of the important things I would like to go and talk about it uh, is the pathogenesis. Why you have to understand the pathogenesis? Basically, the mechanical ventilation is a supportive ther therapy for a diseased alveoli or a diseased lung. So we have to understand what's happening there. So the support would be adequate or the support will be beneficial for the aim that we would like to improve for the gas exchange. And uh, if you look at the pathogenesis of ERDS, you will find multiple resources with good illustration uh, in the literature and in the internet. And I selected this one to go few, uh, through a few things that I probably I would like to explain. So normally, uh, there are millions, of course, of alveoli, but if we look at one unit of uh, the alveoli, it is an air cell which is filled with air. Uh, so number one should be filled with air to uh, uh, to carry the function. The other thing we can see that there are a membrane which is thin membrane with cells that produce surfactant that the alveolar type alveolar type two cells, surfactant layers that keep the alveoli open most of the time, and then lymphatic system that drain the excess fluid there. In addition to that, a basement membrane. So. This is the basic structure, and then it's in a very close 
vicinity for with capillary. So the gas exchange occur at this level for the healthy one. Once a process happened and caused inflammation of the lung, and uh, that progressed to ARDS either with indigenous cause like pneumonia or exogenous cause like pancreatitis, burn or trauma, then an inflammatory process will happen. And this inflammatory process will lead to the exudative stage, which is the first stage of the inflammatory process. So now, instead of having uh, air cells filled with air, no, it will be filled with some fluid. And this fluid is not a hydrostatic simple water fluid. No, it's a fluid that contain platelet, a fluid that contain active immune cells and contain uh, dead injured alveolar cells, inactive, uh, inactive, inactive surfactant, fibrin, and multiple mediators. In addition to that, that thin membrane that usually uh, ensure adequate gas exchange will be uh, really damaged. The high line, with high line membranes, surfactant will be deficient. There will be some, thrombo some uh, thrombosis in the capillary, which is more prominent in ARDS related, uh, 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 COVID related ARDS. So now you can see that the, the cell has a problem in its content, the ability to clear fluid, the ability to generate surfactant, and probably the ability to uh, exchange gas. And the next stage in the process will be the proliferative stage. And the proliferative stage is some sort of a recovery stage where the cells or the alveoli start to recover, fluid will be absorbed, and uh, then will be regeneration of the epithelial cells, removal of the cytokines. And if this continues to happen, probably the, the patient will, uh, will, uh, uh, will recover. If not, then we go to the third, the third stage of the disease, which is the fibrotic stage where more fibrous, fibrous tissue will be, uh, will be there, deposited in the interstitium, deposited in the alveoli, and then the patient will be more hypoxic. And probably we can see at stages with severe ERDS. Of course, we don't select where we found the patient, but the patient go through this process. And uh, you can imagine at what stage you can find your patient. So when we have a diseased alveoli like this alveoli. We would like to help this alveoli, support this alveoli with mechanical ventilation to perform the gas exchange and to compensate for the failure. Important point for any organ to fail, they have to compensate. Nobody will fail or no organ will fail before the trial of compensation. So when the patient reach to a level that he has hypoxemia, okay, uh, that means he tried to, or the lung tried to compensate, doing all the things that they can try with increasing the tidal volume, with increasing the respiratory rate, uh, using the accessory muscles, all these things that to, to help to support these diseased alveoli, and they could not. And then here we have to intervene and support these alveoli with some mechanical uh, support. One important issue I would like to, to emphasize and keep, keep this in mind, it's a very simple. So the alveoli is supposed to be filled with oxygen. The oxygen will pass from the alveoli with no problem, but it has a gradient between the alveoli and the capillary, and this gradient goes abnormally up to 10 and increase with age. So the air sac is filled with air, filled with oxygen. The oxygen will move freely to the capillary, the capillary, the blood in the capillary will move it to the lung, uh, sorry, to the left atrium. And then the CO2 will go pass with no gradient. So the CO2 will pass freely, no gradient, and then stay in the alveoli, it will be moved. And we need um, a minute ventilation to move this uh, CO2. So in a diseased alveoli, either ARDS, pneumonia, or pulmonary edema, what will happen? Uh, not all the airspace will be or the air cell will be available for gas exchange. Um, the gradient probably will increase. So let's say usually if you have 100 molecule of oxygen, 90 will pass freely with no problem. But in a diseased alveoli, you may have about 80, 70, depending on the severity of the disease. And then the CO2, when it comes and stays there maybe you don't have adequate minute ventilation or tidal volume that move the CO2. This is important. And I want you to keep in mind, just to imagine that what you are doing with the mechanical ventilation, you just imagine the alveoli, 
how I need the alveoli. I need an alveoli which is open, had enough oxygen, and it will have the time to move the oxygen from the alveoli to, to the capillary. And when I would like to support, I have to support with important principle, which is the first principle in medicine, doing no harm. My support should not generate harm and inflict harm to the alveoli. And this is, I think, the main point in our ventilation of ARDs. So this is uh, uh, an important point. So you, if you have, and, and, and I will come to this, uh, uh, this diagram, uh, when you have a diseased alveoli in ARDS, you would like to ensure that you uh, deliver a gas in an amount that will be filling the alveoli, compensating for the problem for compensating for the decrease in the amount of air in each air, uh, air cells or each alveoli. And try to avoid two things. I, I will try to avoid you going to the part there is which not all the alveoli are inflated adequately, where you have some atelectic trauma. And the atelectic trauma, basically, if you have atelectasis here, that the alveoli will be collapsed, no much of air coming to these alveoli. So in addition to the infiltrate to the fluid that presents in the alveoli, it is collapsed and there is no space for that. So I would like to avoid this one. And I would like to avoid uh, going to hyperinflation and over distension of the alveoli. So the alveoli will be distended, filled with uh, air in addition to the infiltrate. This also may cause a problem, especially with uh, repeated inflation deflation. So when you have an alveoli goes between inflation, deflation, you increase the shear force injury basically at this point, and this will lead to what we call uh, as a biotrauma, which is not seen, uh, a part of the trauma not seen, but lead to the release of cytokines and inflammatory mediators that will go back ag again and cause more problem to the uh, to the uh, alveoli, and we call this is villi or ventilator-induced lung injury because of this repeated uh, inflation and uh, deflation of 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 uh, the alveoli. Uh, it's important that, uh, in addition, that uh, you have decreased compliance of the alveoli of the lung, the increase the, the physiological dead space. What will happen during this period? You have a lot of biological alteration. Uh, that include increased increased concentration of uh, factor like uh, growth factor, interleukin-8, uh, with the release of uh, mediator like uh, tumor necrosis factor, uh, interleukin-6, interleukin-1, and uh, more recruitment of uh, inflammatory cells like uh, uh, macrophages and neutrophil. So this will lead to some release of the Inflammatory, process, inflammatory mediators to the circulation. And when it's released to the circulation, it will lead also to some sort of uh, organ failure. And this is these patients, with, they can go into other organ failure and actually uh, leading to the death of the patient if things are not corrected in, in a way. So this is the pathogenesis. So what I have, I have alveoli, which has a disrupt membrane filled with the fluid, uh, there is competition between the fluid and the air there. I have to compensate for this, but I would like to avoid doing harm by uh, collapsing the alveoli or offer distension or have repeat uh, uh, opening and closing of the alveoli. And this is what we would like to do with mechanical uh, ventilation. Important thing that we don't see the alveoli. Okay, this is the the, patho the pathogenesis at a micro microscopic level. But how we can this reflect on practice? It uh, reflect by knowing the lung mechanics, and uh, all of us probably know the uh, Brescher um, uh, volume uh, loop of uh, of the lung. Uh, basically, when we uh, put some volume of air in the lung, it will generate a pressure. And th this is the diagram related to it. And we, we assume this is reflecting what's happening in the alveolar, okay? And as we said, we would like to prevent atelectric to trauma and we pre prevent uh, volume trauma with over distension of the alveoli. And we would like to ventilate 
the lung and the alveoli at this level, at the safe window, which is the window between uh, that prevent the alveoli from going collapsed and prevent the distension. How we know, how we do these things, you will come to this point. And this is why people, they think that modalities like high frequency uh, oscillation, ventilation, and air airway pressure release ventilation is safe because you think that you are ventilating the lung in this area, which is safe, uh, prevent over distension and prevent collapsing of the, of, of the alveoli. So this is one of the important principles that we assume. So we have lower inflection point and we have upper inflection point. Below the lower inflection point, I have atelectasis. Above the upper inflection point, I have over distension and, uh, and volume trauma. So I would like just to imagine that these alve disease alveoli that need my help, need my support, I would like to keep it open, okay? And keep it open, I need to keep the pressure above the lower inflection point, and I have to distend the alveoli enough to deliver oxygen, but should not be over distension below the lower inflection point, and uh, we ventilate the patient like this. One of the important things, and uh, you keep in mind the equation of motion. Basically, we have I have a volume and I have a pressure. So the equation that gives me the relationship between the volume and the pressure, it is the equation of motion, we call it, which is the relationship between the pressure and volume. And the other factor affect this will be the lung compliance, it could be the respiratory system or the lung itself. Okay, so, so as we increase the volume, the pressure will increase. As we decrease the compliance, the pressure will increase. Then the other part will be related to the flow and the respiratory resistance, the airway resistance. So when you increase the flow, the pressure increase. When you increase the resistance, the pressure increase. So this pressure volume loop will be variable based on the flow. For example, if you change the flow, you change how uh, the, the, the pressure uh, uh, volume loop will, will happen. So for this, let's say we take this point of volume, we look at the pressure. So once you increase the flow, it goes and increase more pressure. And we can see it. if you change the setting of the mechanical ventilator, you increase the flow, the pressure will go higher. So this is one important thing to keep it in mind. So the, the loop is not fixed, it will change according to what you are doing. And these are the factors leading to it. In addition to that, if you have a disease lung with ERDS, we know that ERDS is not a homogeneous disease. It is a very, very heterogeneous disease. There are area where it's complete collapse of the lung, uh, of the alveoli, there are area of partially alveoli, uh, partially collapsed or a diseased alveoli, and area with normal alveoli. When you apply pressure, the pressure volume loop is not the same. So in this area, because it has uh, decreased compliance, the same volume gives you higher pressure. In this area, which is very well aerated and ventilated, the same volume will give you a lower pressure. So again, not the pressure that we see, you don't know what's the effect in, in other parts of the lung, it's different. So for that, we have the principle of the baby lung. In ERDS, they tell you not all the lung available for you for ventilation, it is a baby lung. Part of it is completely not contributing, partly partially contributing, part will be fully contributing to gas exchange. And this affects the mechanics of the lung. And this is why probably if you make this area homogeneous, more homogeneous by recruiting the alveoli, and one of the best methods of recruitment by basically with the prone position, you improve the variability in the pressure volume loop between different parts of the lung. So the differences between the loops in different parts of the lung will be more uh, homogeneous. And we'll come to the prone position later on. This has been also illustrated using uh, uh, using um, advanced method like a spectro uh, electromography and looking at different parts of the lung and it shows here uh, for example, uh, uh, where different aeration of the lung is there and the pressure volume is, is, is different based on the area uh, of lower, uh, of uh, low 
um, inflation and or recruitment or airspace that has more air to the airspace that has more fluid. So this is important point. When you apply mechanical ventilation, consider that there is variability on what you do on the alveoli. So what you are doing could be harmful to some of the alveoli and could be useful to other alveoli. And this is again an illustration, if it is clear, I hope it's clear, that in high in high in high frequency oscillatory ventilation, we would like to ventilate above the upper infl uh, lower infliction inflic uh, infliction point in a safe zone, and it shows there how the alveoli will open, and uh, to correlate this again and to keep it okay to keep it in mind. Hope it will run. Uh, we will illustrate it in another uh, graphic format. Uh, the relationship between where we are ventilating the lung uh, and its relation to the pressure volume loop and how we can imagine the lung. So when we ventilate below the lower inflection point, you can see uh, here the lung is atelectatic, not inflated. Once you start to go above the lower inflection point, you ventilate the lung, good part of it will be ventilated. And then if you go to the distension part, it will be over distended and then you have the inflation part and the deflation part. What I would like to do to keep the lung uh, reasonably inflated, reasonably contributing to the uh, gas exchange. So this is an uh, important point and this is um, one of the things that I have to keep in mind. All the time also, with, uh, keep in mind the alveoli. I need to keep the alveoli open, distended, has oxygen. And the other things that I correlate this alveoli, which is open, contain oxygen, with pressure time curve on the mechanical ventilation. If you have a pressure curve, you have the time. So the pressure time curve, the mean airway pressure form for me or will be uh, uh, analogy, analogy for uh, the alveoli, which is will be distended for adequate time containing more oxygen. So when we'd like to improve oxygenation, I would like to have more oxygen in the alveoli, keep it distended, keep it distended for longer time to keep to give the oxygen more time to transfer from the alveoli. The same thing for the mean airway uh, pressure. The, the mean airway pressure uh, should be adequate. Uh, so when we'd like to improve oxygenation, I increase the mean airway pressure. How I increase it? I increase it by increasing the time, I increasing um, and increasing the pressure. How we ventilate patient with ARDS? I think if you ask any one of you, I think the golden uh, uh, the golden word, and uh, I would like to hear it when I ask how we ventilate a patient with uh, ARDS. It's a simple thing. It, it is a very, a very known now for more than twenty years. We have to do protective lung strategy. Uh, what is protective lung strategy. Why we say protective lung strategy? Because in the past, between, before the uh, 2000, before, uh, two, uh, before the, Yes. Dr. Khaled, I think, yani, I just want you to give a message for all of them because, you know, yani, I notice now our even residents, they are not focusing on the pathophysiology or physiological process or how it will be uh, uh, reflected in management. Yani, the importance of going through the uh, inflection points, pathogenesis, heterogeneity of the RDS, even inflammatory process you had mentioned already. I think it's very important for everyone to know it in details because it is reflected on clinical base, not only to know how uh, ARDS be vented, but even though the, the, this basic will be affected their performance in clinical practice. Are you agree with me or? Uh... I think uh, this is the main point I would like to deliver in this lecture, yeah, Abu Ahmed. Lanu, uh, as a specialized in this field, we have to know the basic. So when we do something on the bit side, we know what does it reflect. We have they had to, to have the imagination. We have to uh, to know what we are doing to the lung. I think uh, it, it's absolutely it is the most important point. I agree with you. Thank you. Right. So when we say protective lung strategy, before the year two thousand, we were ventilating patient, and basically the mortality was high in these patients because different things. And before two thousand, and maybe early in the 
2001-2002, I when we practice, we saw a lot of bar trauma, which I don't see these days. So we are doing harm to the lungs because we are not ventilating in a protective way. What's the protective way? That you avoid the lie, ventilator induced uh, lung injury. You avoid barotrauma, you, you avoid injury of the, of, of, of the alveoli. And in the past, people, they used to use tidal volume of 10 to 12 ml per kg. And maybe they don't use ideal body weight, they use actual body weight. So these things change. And now when we say how we ventilate a patient with ARDS, the answer will be by, okay, it's hanging, by protective lung strategy. Uh, usually when I talk about protective lung strategy, I will say, um, okay. I will say there are few pillars in protective lung strategy. And this graph, it will find it in different way. One of the important basic thing that I would like to make it a habit. If you say, what is the mechan what is the ventilatory setting? How we ventilate a patient? The first question I will ask, what is the ideal body weight? Very important. The importance of the ideal body weight that the volume of the lung is created based on the gender and the height of the patient, of, of, of us, of the human being. If I get chubby and gain weight, my lung volume after I get adult, it will not change. If I come thinner and slimmer, my lung volume will not. So what I have to ventilate is the lung volume, which is in the human being with the ideal body weight. So I have to calculate the ideal body weight. I'm not good in equation, but if you open your browser in any uh, phone or any internet, you find it. If you don't have it, you have to calculate it in a simple way uh, using centimeter or inches. And then this is the body weight. Then the other important point is really, as we said, we would like to ventilate with a volume that prevent atelectric trauma and we decrease uh, uh, the over distinction. So we choose to have a low tidal volume, low tidal volume compared to what has been or had been used in the past. So we're using a tidal volume between four to six ml per kg ideal body weight. Which one I start? You can start at any point. You can start with the lower and you go higher. You can start at the higher coming down or in the middle and then you adjust according to the plateau pressure. Why the plateau pressure? Because the plateau pressure, it is the pressure we obtain it during inspiratory hold, where is no flow in the alveoli. So if you remember the equation of motion, the flow multiplied by the resistance to be zero. So what reflect for me is the relationship between volume compliance and the pressure. So when I measure the plateau pressure, it reflects for me the pressure inside the alveoli. And we have to keep it at a safe level. What is the safe level? As been in the studies, it is less than 30, millim 30, 30 centimeter water. So you start at certain point and then you adjust it according to the uh, plateau pressure. Of course, when you use a low tidal volume, there is a price to pay. The price because the CO2 will come stay there, need minute ventilation. You reduce the minute ventilation by reducing the tidal volume, so you have the hypercapnia. So I have to allow, I have to permit some hypercapnia to the degree that I maintain a safe pH. And then the other point, if you remember the alveoli, I need to keep it open most of that. I don't have enough surfactant in the alveoli. I have to keep it open with a continuous positive airway pressure, which is the PEEP. PEEP is positive in the expiratory, but it is actually a continuous pressure through all the cycle during inspiration and during expiration. And then I have to keep the PEEP probably to keep the alveoli to, uh, open even during inspiration. So the PEEP should be set above the lower inflection point that we mentioned in the pressure volume loop. So the PEEP should be set there. How I know if you have tools like a bit side CT scan or uh, electro impedance, maybe it help you. But really, you have to try. 
how I try, you go with your peep and then you look at the relationship between the pressure and the volume and the compliance and you choose the peep that give you the best relationship between the pressure and volume. The IE, if I'm using volume control, so I use the beep that will give me the best pressure for this set volume. Otherwise, if I'm using pressure control ventilation, I will use the PEEP that give me the best volume with a, a set pressure. And then how I know this, you have to try it in your patient. And we'll talk about PEEP uh, at, at this point. So this is important. So, so what are the pillar of low tidal volume or protective lung strategy? Low tidal volume, keeping the plateau less than 30, and use PEEP to improve oxygenation. And what you can use actually in, in the ARDS network study that it came the 2000 and changed the practice, this is the suggested uh, uh, table. You go with, with the PEEP according to the FIO2, but do you have to stick to this? You may try to start what you are doing and then you adjust. Important point, patient are, they are different. So doesn't apply for every patient. So if you would like to do the best, you have to be at the bedside, try with your patient to see what's the best for your patient. Fine. So this is the study, the summary of the ARDS net, which was published in 2000, uh, the year 2000 in the Young Journal of Medicine. And it was a breakthrough in medicine. It is among the most important article in critical care medicine. And it showed that when you use a low tidal volume, it improves survival, it improves discharge home, it improves uh, the ventilator free days with statistical significance, with a statistical significance here. And you can see from the graph here, this is uh, uh, the survival and discharge for the traditional volume. It's much lower. This is the survival and this is the discharge. The discharge is more with a low tidal volume and the survival is more with low tidal volume. Since then, since then, we are using low tidal volume. And as time goes, it's proof that this is the way that we go. What we are doing in the past was harmful for the patient and you have to stick to the ideal body weight. It's important. And then as years, uh, uh, time goes in 2015, Amato, he used um, he, he, in, an, in a, an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, what he did, he took all the studies looking at uh, ARDS management and then uh, using low tidal volume and he did a complex statistical method uh, to look what are the things that improve survival in this patient and he came with the recommendation to use the driving pressure. The driving pressure is the difference between the plateau and the peep. And he found that if you look here, one, that means no difference between the two intervention. But at the driving pressure of this than 15, we can below 15, we can see there is a difference. There is improvement in the survival and improvement uh, in the outcome of, of this patient if the driving pressure. So an addition to what we are saying for protective lung strategy, in addition to the plateau pressure is than 30, I have to keep the driving pressure below 50, uh, below 15. And it has been used also to set the, uh, the optimal peep uh, using the driving pressure. Right. And uh, one of the other things we use to target uh, a higher oxygen uh, concentration uh, but now we accept the lower oxygen uh, saturation, uh, sorry, oxygen saturation in, in patients with uh, ARDS. And this study compared liberal and conservative oxygen therapy in acute respiratory distress uh, 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 syn syndrome. And they found uh, that uh, uh, conservative oxygenation uh, between 50 to 57 uh, did not increase survival. Uh, so we have to keep probably our oxygenation at the target between uh, 90 or uh, 88 to 92. Uh, I think I missed the one slide. 92, so the target probably, you should not go for a very high oxygen saturation. Your target for oxygen should be lower. So sometimes we would like to do more in the mechanical ventilation to get a higher oxygen saturation. You should not do this, but also 
uh, keeping it a lower oxygen will not improve survival, but uh, going to higher oxygen saturation also will not improve the survival. So we should not do harmful ventilation to keep the um, oxygen saturation at a higher level. Uh, then studies come to the PEEP. Shall we use high PEEP or low PEEP in ARD uh, uh, patients? And then uh, uh, this study published in uh, 2004 in New England Journal of Medicine. And basically uh, they compare two level of, uh, of PEEP, um, high PEEP and uh, low PEEP group and they look at the, the outcome. So if you look at death before discharge home, there is no difference between the high and low PEEP. Uh, breathing with assistance, there is no difference. Number of ventilator free days, there is no difference. Number of days spent in the intensive care unit, there is no difference. Barotrauma, there is no difference. Number of days of circulatory uh, coagulation, hepatic renal organ uh, failure, um, there is basically no difference. So using higher or lower P doesn't make difference. But when we go to um, to systematic analysis and systematic review meta-analysis, systematic review meta-analysis of uh, different studies, looking at uh, higher or lower P, and they compare what they call low P with the P of uh, uh, above five, we, we, even when they use no PEEP, they, they mean no PEEP, it is minimally five uh, of, of PEEP. And if you look here, uh, basically, uh, about um, uh, here, uh, mortality in the ER, this patient, there is an improve in the outcome for the patient who improve with higher PEEP or with PEEP uh, in terms of oxygenation. So if the patient, apply, you apply PEEP and oxygenation improve this, application of PEEP would improve outcome. So if you are increasing the PEEP and it's not improving oxygenation, it's unlikely to improve the outcome of, of these patients. So it's important to look at this point. And if you look at, again, uh, they look at the ICU mortality. So I think that was an, an uh, hospital mortality. This is the ICU mortality. Again, if the patients, the group, they analyze the group who have positive oxygenation response to PEEP, the outcome of this patient is improving and favoring the utilization of higher PEEP. To conclude, uh, again, no, this is uh, uh, the barotrauma. So you can say, okay, if I use high PEEP, I will expose the patient to increase risk of barotrauma, this meta-analysis telling you if you are using high PEEP, it usually will not cause a higher rate of baro, bar, uh, bar, uh, barotrauma. And to conclude here is basically high PEEP did not improve the outcome in these patients, but the subgroup analysis showed that high PEEP decreased hospital and ICU mortality in ARDS patients with a clinically objective positive oxygen response to PEEP. Okay. Bye. Now, so how I ventilate a patient with ARDS, I ventilate with protective lung strategy, which include low tidal volume, keeping the plateau less than 30, keeping the drafting pressure around 15, and um, uh, keeping uh, utilizing PEEP and, uh, uh, in, in, in these patients and uh, to allow some hypercapnia uh, in this patient as long as the BH is allowed. But, Sometimes patients, they don't improve. If the patient is not improving with these basic principle of mechanical ventilation, this basic principle that I'm trying to keep the alveoli open and uh, doing what, what, what we said about, uh, about the mechanical ventilation, what I should do, I have to try other supportive measure. What other supportive measure? Non-ventilatory supportive measure, paralysis, um, a muscle relaxant, using... Uh, uh, diuresis and reducing the volume, treating with bronchodilator, treating with antibiotic, treating with underlying cause. I check if there is something preventing the patient from getting benefit of what I'm doing, like a patient asynchronous to the mechanical ventilation or the patient with, because if we are increasing the rate to compensate for the minute ventilation, the patient has O2 beep, or sometimes patient, they don't like uh, falling control. I try to switch the modes between 
uh, volume control, uh, pressure regulated uh, uh, volume control. I may try NAVA, I may try ABRV, different things to see if it, it works. And if you found that, no, probably what happening is because of the disease severity and the, the, the severity of the, AR, of the ARDS, what I should do at this point. There are a few things you can try and uh, we'll show it here uh, in the mechanical ventilation. And one of the important thing I think I would recommend to do and try, and this has been proven over and over to be beneficial. And we, when we mentioned and we talk about the basic, when you do browning positioning, uh, the browning positioning basically, I recruit more alveoli that reside in the dorsal part of the lung and I improve the homogeneity between the air cells and the relationship between the volume pressure curve will be probably more linear, more smooth in this situation. So this is related to the, uh, uh, to the basic. And it has proofing. If you look at images, if you have look at CT scan images, if you look at uh, uh, electro impedance images, it show you to you when you prone the patient. This is subine. You put him prone. More aeration happen in this area, the dorsal bar near the, the near the the, uh, the spine. And when you put the patient back to supine, it goes back to be less aerated bar. So prone is very important thing that we have to keep in mind. And one of the landmark studies for prone, which is the Proceva, which published in 2000, uh, uh, 2013. And basically, they included patients with severe ARDS with BO2, if I to ratio less than 50, intubated for more than 36 days. They are stable hemodynamically. They are not uh, with any contraindication like uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension or intracranial hypertension. And they are ruled 466 patients into two groups, the prone position group for 16 hours, okay? And no browning. And what they get, uh, a, a, a remarkable uh, benefit for ventilator three days within 20 days, 14 to 10 with significant B value, more successful extubation in the brown group, with a significantly statistically significant difference, similar rate of tracheostomy and improvement on the mortality with a statistically significant difference. So this is a very good thing in terms to prove that prone positioning is something helpful. But, but we have to keep in mind that Brusiva, uh, uh, their definition for ARDS, they optimize the mechanical ventilation for 12 to 14 hours. And then if the patient has B, uh, BF ratio less than 150, they consider this patient has severe ARDS, include them in the, uh, in the study. Uh, and uh, they consider paralysis and, and, and browning before that. So this is important to keep in mind. So browning is not the first thing that I will go, but if the patient has severe, ARDS, I paralyze the patient, and then I will uh, prone the patient. And uh, in, in different studies, it's shown here, like if you can see the letter SMP, this is subine, and this is prone position. So during subine, BO4 ratio will decrease. During proning, it increased. I could put the patient subine decrease. So it improved oxygenation for that. In the past, people, they used to uh, do proning short period, but now when you prone the patient will go to about 16 hours uh, based uh, similar to the uh, procedure. Uh, why brown uh, will improve uh, uh, oxygenation? We said about more recruitment of the alveoli in the dorsal part, but other theory that because when the patient is subine, more part of the more of, of the heart will Will, uh, will compress on the lung. So we improve the ventilation distribution by relieving that part. Um, the small, smaller volume of lung is dependent. So we increase uh, the functional residual capacity and reduce the shunt probably. When we prone the patient, we decrease the, the, the pressure of the abdomen into the chest and improve secretion mobilization, improve uh, maybe resolve uh, the delivery. And then hence we improve the ventilation, we improve the VQ mismatch in, in, in this patient, but definitely it improves oxygenation and it improves the outcome of these patients. And if you look 
look at this table, it will tell you uh, there are five studies they use brown positioning and it's starting from 1996 to the 2011. And the duration of brown you can see started seven uh, hour for five days, nine hour, then we go to 16, 17 hour and the Proceva. Uh, but the remarkable thing that the use of low tidal volume was in the Proceva. The briefest study, they did not show a difference in mortality between the two groups, but Proceva, it showed a significant change in mortality. Why? Because they use the combination of low tidal volume and browning. So in patients who are not responding to protective lung strategy, we paralyze the patient, and then we brown the patient using low tidal volume plus browning, this will improve mortality in these patients. So this is, should be the practice and we have how, how we go. Again, this is uh, another meta-analysis published in 2017, looking at brown positioning. And uh, this is basically uh, looking at the outcome, the mortality of patients when they are brown and it's safer brown, even they included uh, some studies uh, uh, before the Bruceva, in 2013, so if all of the previous study used probably low tidal volume, maybe the result will be will, will be different and it will be favoring more uh, the brown positioning. And this is again to illustrate when you are so when the patient is subine, see how much of disease lung will be in the dependent part. When you flip this patient into a brown positioning, you create more of the lung and you can see here, even the area which is over irrigated will be more when the patient in, in, in brown, um, uh, sorry, uh, it's over irrigated when the patient is subine. When you do the brown, you get more homogeneous ventilation, less over irrigated, less poorly irrigated uh, lung compared to the, <coughs> to the subine position. Uh, getting only, if you listen to Gattinoni, he is a believer that how I know the patient will respond to brown. Of course, oxygenation is one guy to tell you, but CO2 responder, decrease in the BCO2 with brown position is a predictive improved outcome in acute respiratory disease. The message from this study, when you brown patient, you don't, don't only use oxygenation, but look at the CO2. If the patient clears CO2 more, that's mean, the patient is responding to browning, and this is important message to be uh, looking so independent, independently of the ventilator sitting, which was maintained and modified. The patient who reacted to brown positioning with decrease in the partial pressure of CO2 had a better outcome than the patient who did not. The BCO2 change per se does not seem influence the outcome. I think. Um, outcome, we have to be careful to measure everything by looking at the uh, mortality because this needs a lot of work. But if it improves gas exchange, for me, that improves the physician intervention, the changes that may cause harm for the patient. Right. Then we move to another thing. As we said, remember the other uh, would, would you like to keep the questions at the end? Or we can give you some break in between for the some quiz uh, for each section. Uh, I think uh, we just want you to talk rest in between. <laughs> but I think it's very long. Yeah, you are covering all of the aspects of the ARDS. And yeah, let us have one. And yeah, for proning, for example, I think we cannot leave the proning without talking your experience in COVID. Of course, especially this one, it is different. Front <laughs> and increasing the popularity of the browning worldwide, right? Of course, browning in COVID now, um, I think COVID confirmed, confirmed that browning for ARDS is useful. And uh, browning now, uh, COVID helped us to say browning can be done on awake patient and it's useful. And it may help the patient uh, with respiratory failure to progress and go to severe ARDS. So I think COVID illustrated this point very, very well. And you may see further publication coming, uh, confirming this point. And uh, I think uh, there is a, a one landmark trial for for uh, COVID browning by Dr. Walid Lahazani, of course. 
the Saudi researcher in Canada, right? He's a, it would be like, I think we have it, even uh, not affecting mortality, but improving in hypoxemia and very, very uh, eminent trial, multi-center worldwide, and a lot of uh, patients from Saudi Arabia, a lot of centers, uh, including yes. in this trial. This is, this, is what I'm telling, this is what I'm telling you, that it will come in the future. You can see that even in non-ventilated patient, proning is useful. One of the things probably uh, uh, related to ARDs and ARDs man uh, management of severe ARDs, proning of ECMO patient, patient on venovenous ECMO, when they yes. use brawn combination with ECMO, they have a better uh, decannulation rate and a better out, uh, a better uh, extubation rate for this patient. You see, yani, I'm I agree with you, Dr. Khaled. Proning, yani, just yani, very wide extreme of proning from awake patient until ECMO patient. All of them will get benefit from that. But I think also they have, once when anyone back think he, he has to have like own protocol because it needs special uh, um, uh, trained personnel, the special places to do. It could be easy, it could be harmful also. It could be, uh, if not done in proper way, right? I agree uh, with me, I think. Uh, uh, Browning, uh, definitely it need uh, a trained personnel. They need a protocol and, uh, but it is doable. It is, when it's done rightly, it is safe. And if you look at the literature nowadays, not only we're talking about ECMO, but even patient with tracheostomy. If the patient, they have tracheostomy, they do broaden this patient and they found this is also safe when it's done the right way. Uh, why we don't do broaden? Because the difficulty initially of turning the patient, but if you have the trained personnel, enough number of personnel, um, they can do it and we should not have an excuse not doing prod. There are a few things you have to keep in mind and you be ready for it, you prevent pressure injury, you, uh, you, uh, even uh, you look at the experience regarding feeding, uh, you can feed this patient with no problem. Uh, people they are worried about if, if, what if something happened to the patient, like patient has barotrauma, you can insert this tube in somebody who's prone, uh, what happened if the patient have uh, uh, a wrist? There are ways also how to resuscitate patient uh, when they are brown uh, to start to initiate the, the, uh, the CBR and then how you flip them. Uh, all these people, they, they, they try it and uh, we should try it. I, uh, I, I was believing before that you have to have this prone bed, which is almost more than million real. <laughs> I think nowadays with, with trained personnel, you can do it. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 for me, I think uh, looking for um, those, paid, it's very expensive. It's not available and you could not, you could not really equip every hospital with, with such bits. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, if you'd like to continue, we don't have more questions. As you like, Ahmed. Shuf al shabab عندك ما I don't see in the chat if there is. No, we have one question in EBRV, but I think I postponed that till we finish. Maybe we'll cover, not now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. we will cover. Yes, right. I think so. Thank you, Doctor Khalid. Okay. In first ratio ventilation, if we remember the alveoli, we said we need to keep the alveoli open, filled with oxygen, and give more time for the oxygen to go. Then we use the inverse ratio ventilation. And with that, I improve the area under the care. I improve the mean airway pressure during the inspiratory cycle uh, by using inverse ratio ventilation. What's the evidence for inverse ratio ventilation? Uh, there are studies. Uh, there are three studies here and they included a small number of, uh, of patients. Uh, and what the first study concluded that it is safe to implement inverse ratio ventilation in this patient with severe um, uh, respiratory failure, uh, and it improved oxygenation at lower minute ventilation, peak airway pressure, and PEEP requirement. Uh, the second study, the uh, Mercat, they have eight patients only. Uh, they said the result in significant intrinsic PEEP, uh, the uh, in, uh, IRV at a ratio that result in significant intrinsic does not improve oxygenation and enhance CO2 elimination, decrease cardiac output, and they doesn't exert any time-dependent effect. Third study with the same uh, author, but this is two, that one 
The first one was in 1997, second one was in 2001. And they said in patient with uh, ARDS extending the expiratory time without inducing clinically significant increase in intrinsic B doesn't consist improve arterial oxygenation, but enhance CO2 elimination. So there is no strong evidence to support the use in first ratio ventilation, but you can try it. As we say, patients that are different, you can try it safely uh, in these patients and see if it is improving the oxygenation. And this is one of the methods that we are using these days uh, to improve oxygenation, keeping in mind the basic principle of keeping the alveoli distended longer time to allow more oxygen to travel from the alveoli to the capillary uh, and improve the mean airway pressure and improve the oxygenation. Lung recruitment. Uh, I think we recruit lung with proning, but we can also recruit lung using mechanical ventilation. Is this useful or not? So basically the recruitment maneuver is a process of inducing an intentional transient increase in transpulmonary pressure aimed at reopening of non-aerated or poorly aerated alveoli. So what we do, we go increase the pressure in the alveoli for a short period of time, hoping that these collapsed alveoli will be open with this high pressure. But we don't maintain this pressure, the high pressure for a long period. We keep it for, uh, for a few minutes and then we go back. Uh, the immediate expected benefit will be improvement in oxygenation and respiratory systemic compliance. Improve oxygenation because we open more alveoli, we allow more alveoli to contribute in the gas exchange. We improve the VQ mismatching and also because we improve the amount of volume. Okay, going to the alveoli, we improve the compliance, the system compliance. Okay, how we do recruitment maneuver, there are two major ways to do it. One of these ways that you go and put a, a pressure of 40 airway pressure for 40 seconds. How I can do this, you can do it in the usual mechanical ventilation or the best way you do it through a BRV. Uh, but how we do it, you change the alarm setting so the alarm will not uh, continue alarming and the mechanical ventilation. So increase the apnea time to more than 40 seconds. You um, uh, decrease the rate and then you put the patient on CPAP uh, or PEEP of 40 and then uh, no ventilation for 40 seconds and then you go back. But when you go back after this period of ventilation for 40, cent 40 uh, uh, centimeter water for 40 seconds, you have to increase the PEEP to keep the alveoli which open during this recruitment. Uh, and for example, if you are in PEEP of 10, you can go to 20 and then you come lower. The other way is to go with your airway pressure, total peak airway pressure to the level of 50 using PEEP and the inspiratory pressure. And you make the difference between the inspiratory pressure, the peak pressure and PEEP is about 15 centimeter water. So you go, for example, from 25, the PEEP is 25 to, uh, uh, and the peak airway pressure 40, you increase the PEEP to 30, you increase the, the PEEP to 35, reach to, you reach to um, uh, a peak airway pressure of 50, but the difference between the peak airway pressure and the PEEP is 15. You keep it for a while, for one sec, uh, uh, one minute, for example, and then you come down with this, we're keeping also higher PEEP. So the BP will be 23, 20, 17, 11. And then you can do another recruitment uh, uh, maneuver later on. Uh, if you look at this study published in JAMA in 2008, uh, they look at ventilatory strategy using low tidal volume recruitment maneuver and high, positive peep, uh, high PEEP for ARDS. They found that there is no difference when you do recruitment maneuver in terms of uh, how long the patient would be in mechanical ventilation in terms of mortality. Uh, and it improves oxygenation, but it will not improve uh, the outcome as, as we mentioned. For me, improving oxygenation is very uh, good thing that I have to try as long as it will not worsen the outcome of this patient. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at recruitment maneuvers 
uh, and they look at the effective recruitment maneuver on oxygenation after 30 minutes of open lung ventilation. Open lung ventilation, that's mean I go do recruitment maneuver, I open the alveoli and keep the, the alveoli open with a higher peak, basically a recruitment maneuver. And it showed that oxygenation get better with recruitment maneuver. And the confidence interval is basically, uh, is basically doesn't cross the one Usually when you have the forest plot here, if it is in one side that it may, that it favor that side. If it's not crossing the midline, it showed that the benefit of that side, it favor that side clearly. So it improved oxygenation. And if we look at the ratio between the dead space and the, uh, the tidal volume, it also, it favor uh, the recruitment maneuver. So you improve, opening of the alveoli, which contributing to the gas exchange, you decrease the dead space, you decrease the area which is ventilated, not, but uh, not contributing to the gas exchange. And uh, with, with that, you improve uh, oxygenation. And again, from the same, uh, uh, the same meta-analysis, they look at all patient with high, uh, with high tidal volume and no recruitment to improve oxygenation. They look at patients with low tidal volume and no, recruit, and, and, uh, no recruitment. Uh, the BO2 will be better with, uh, with, with, with recruitment, basically. So recruitment, in general, it will help in uh, improving oxygenation. This is uh, basically the summary of the, of, of the meta-analysis they included. They look at 926 articles, they included 16 studies, 836 patients, and they found recruit maneuver increased oxygenation, decreased the space fraction, and the positive index battery, the effect of PEEP, basically, uh, PEEP improved oxygenation and improved lung uh, compliance with uh, open lung strategy. Okay, next we will talk about uh, airway pressure release ventilation. This is what we call non-conventional mode of mechanical ventilation or rescue therapy, uh, people, uh, some people, they, they try to use it. And uh, if you look, it, it doesn't have a lot of, of, uh, of utilization uh, in ICUs because we're using low tidal volume, but it's something sometimes you may want to try uh, after you know how it's, it's functioning. This study published uh, in Intensive Care Medicine in 2017, they look at the early application of airway pressure release ventilation, and they say it may reduce mechanical ventilation uh, days in ERDS, and they included patients with severe ERDS intubated more than 48 hours, but they don't have COBD or refractory shock or pulmonary hypertension. It's only 138 patient, mostly patient with pneumonia, and the airway pressure release ventilation, I'll show it later on probably uh, for that. And they compare it with ARDS low tidal volume ventilation, the protective lung strategy. And they found that uh, ventilatory free days within 28 days was, uh, was 19 patient compared to two with statistically significant number. Successful extubation was 66 to 39. Trachistomy was basically more in the low tidal volume, and this was uh, mortality was more in 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 uh, uh, in the low tidal volume compared to the AR, the ABRV. Uh, this is uh, the percentage of patients without assistance. It's more in the, with the ABRV. Uh, and this is a systematic analysis. They look at airway pressure release ventilation during ARDS, uh, and they look at ventilator free days, and the ventilator free days, it favor ABRV. Uh, as you can see here, the confidence interval doesn't cross the one, and it favor uh, the ABRV, and confirming the finding in the briefest studies. If you look at the hospital mortality, it favor ABRV. If you look at the BO2, FIO2 ratio, uh, there is no difference between the two groups. Uh, why we are not using it? Um, there is no, it's only one study. 
And this study showed that uh, a higher number of ventilator-free days and lower hospital mortality in hypoxemic patient treated with BRV than conventional ventilation without any negative hemodynamic impact or high-risk barotrauma. But this result to be interpreted in caution because of the evidence they consider it's low and uh, moderate heterogeneity found. Uh, it's difficult to draw a, a message uh, from uh, this study and still the ABRV, uh, um, there is no adequate comparison between it and between the gold standard, let's say, of, of low tidal volume ventilation. In the future, I don't know what will happen. And basically, let me uh, skip this slide and go to this slide. And what is uh, uh, ABRV? ABRV, basically, you set your ventilator into uh, four parameters in addition to the, FI, to the FiO2. Uh, B high, B low, T high, T low. B high is the pressure at a higher level. So some people, they call it by level. So you have a high pressure level that usually sit it around the mean airway pressure of the conventional mechanical ventilation or a little or five centimeter above that. So this is the B high. The pressure would be around, let's say 30. And then the T high is the time that the pressure will remain this during this period. So let's say we have from two to eight, this is six seconds that the pressure will be maintained at a pressure of 30. And then we have the low pressure, which is the below, which could be zero or it could be three or four centimeter water. And the time is spent during this time. And this could be a very brief time, which could be portion of the second or less than one second. And the idea of this, that during this period, it's similar to the inverse ratio of ventilation. Basically, you do a continuous recruitment, continuous uh, in first ratio of ventilation on this patient, but the difference that during this mode of mechanical ventilation, the expiratory valve will be open so the patient can breathe spontaneously. And there are thought that during this spontaneous breathing, you will create more alveolar. And as we say that the B low will be above the lower inflection point, and the, the B high will be below the uh, upper inflection point, so we ventilate the patient with a safe uh, method. Uh, for, uh, for me, do we use ABRV? We don't. Why? We don't have the expertise. People, they are not using it. We are not using it. And, and you don't have enough evidence to say it's better than uh, the low tidal uh, volume ventilation. Last part of my talk will be talking about high frequency oscillatory ventilation. Khaled, uh, if you allow me for ABRB, because the, the, uh, our admin is asking many questions about ERV, who is very interested about ERV. Uh, okay. You mentioned to Khaled about the experience of the ABRV. Uh, do you see the difference? You mentioned in detail that the literature does it so, doesn't show difference and did expert. And uh, the question, is there a criteria to select the patient? who can get benefit from the EBRV. Uh, I think we agree with me, Dr. Khaled, and you are saying always earlier would be better. So if you try him early, but expert experience, and it could be better for oxygenations and improving. So do you have comment for him? Another question for him also, I think from our admin, the paralyzed, did you need to paralyze the patient for, for EBRV? Okay. I don't think so. This is the one, yeah, I was with Khaled. Okay, let's take it one by one. Um, yes. ABRV, who are the patients you select them for ABRV? Usually they select patients, they are not responding to conventional mode of mechanical ventilation. So people, they go for ABRV, like some rescue therapy and non-conventional way. Uh, if you say, can we use it earlier? You can, but I don't know if you will leave the strong evidence for low tidal volume and you go for ABRV. Uh, number two, which can you say, Ahmed? He's uh, asking the, about the muscle relaxant, and you will use muscle one, relaxant. One of the advantage, one of the advantage of ABRV that the patient can breathe spontaneously. So that means probably use less sedation, less muscle relaxant in these patients. But sometimes, if the patient is severe enough and you could not uh, ventilate the patient, we will sedate and ventilate the patient with sedation. But you you lose the benefit 
of spontaneous breathing. And there are a lot of talk during spontaneous breathing, how the pressure will be going, how it will be, is it going to be high or low? But people claim that probably the uh, recruitment of the alveoli will be better with uh, some uh, spontaneous breathing. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, of questions, uh, but there is no certain answer. And for me, you can ask me why you are not using ABRV. Number one, I will not leave the strong evidence for somebody with questionable evidence. Number two, when I put a patient on ABRV, next day I found it to be changed because people, they don't know how to use it. There are few tricks. There are few important things, how you adjust the ABRV to get the most benefit of the ventilation. So- uh, uh, Yes, yes, continuous. Yeah, so th these are the two main uh, reasons. Uh, which patient will benefit? I don't know. You have to try, okay? But again, let's imagine now you have a patient with ARDS and you elected to use ABRV and the patient died. Can you defend yourself? Do you have the evidence that this is better than low tidal volume? Question to you, Ahmed, and the admin. I think it's clear answer. In low tidal volume, Dr. Khalid is the one, the only, يعني, maybe the, we have any, uh, the trials which showing uh, improving mortality in all ICUs is very, very limited, not, not more than uh, يعني, uh, five or 10 studies. One of them is low tidal volume. So nobody nobody can argue with uh, comparing uh, low tidal yeah. volume or protective strategy with ABRV. This is why we were probably we are not using it. And yeah. I don't think people are interested to do more studies about it. This is the thing. But yeah, if you allow me to tell you, actually I did use ABRV for some patients. And as you have mentioned, uh, yeah, and, uh, and even when I'm write, reading in literature, there are some cancers, which is fit, not cancers, even some uh, authors or uh, intensivists, which is fan of ABRV, which is limited, but the most of them not fan of that. But really, I think ABRV went from the, uh, let us say, art of uh, rescue therapy, because uh, adjustment of the ABRV need, need clinical experience, especially the T low. T low is one from the very important point to be adjusted because you can accumulate CO2, you can release the CO2, you can give low tidal volume, you can have tidal volume. It needs expert RT, of course, with intensivists to deal with ABRV. Uh, but as mentioned by Dr. Khalid, the beauty of ABRV is spontaneous breathing. So you are relying on uh, contracting of the diaphragm, which is almost you know, improving the collapse, especially of the posterior area of the lung, which cannot be done by any uh, controlled mood. So uh, ABRV, and my, my own belief is it good in good experience hand without, and also one from that, and the patient will not improve uh, dramatically within, uh, once you connect it, usually you're connecting the ABRV patient, you can find him shallow breathing, a small tidal volume, give him two to four hours to have the effect. If you especially don't have the effect, has, especially Ahmed, yes. if the patient has hypercapnia. Yes, struggle. usually this is the problem. This is the problem, Dr. Khalid, I agree with you. The problem with the hypercapnia and dealing with that, one from the yani, uh, big problem, but you can deal with the adjustment very cautious. And if you connect him early, of course, you have to try low lung, lung ventilation, the protective lung ventilation first. Then before uh, yani, going uh, yani, with the more rescue therapy, if you try it early, uh, you can find the benefit from that. But uh, the benefit from that recruitment, uh, work of breathing decrease. But if you don't if you don't find that, no, as Dr. Khalid mentioned, you have to lock him down and knock him down at the muscle accent and go with a different maneuver for rescue therapy. And also one very, very important point Dr. Khalid mentioned, you need 24 hours who's expert in dealing with that. In the morning, in the round, you can deal with that. For a for few hours, you can find some improvement, start to recruit his alveoli at night, Maybe you can find the one who's very, uh, does like the way of breathing, CO2 increasing, a little, so he'll paralyze him again and connect him back to another controlled ventilation. So uh, with well expert hand, early patient dealing with the uh, parameters, you can get benefit, but you know, I think in clinical practice, you need the uh, setting which can allow you to do that. Uh, I think uh, the admin, uh, we answered all of the questions about the ABRV or for the, yes, I think, doctor. As, as I mentioned, Ahmed, when the patient is not responding to initial setting of a protected lung strategy and low tidal volume, you may try ABRV early. Uh, if you if you would like to, to try, uh, this is something you, you may consider. Uh, 
we mentioned earlier. Uh, and again, again, um, as I said, where is your patient uh, sitting uh, in the process of the disease? Is he early or late? Uh, the problem when you use ABRD, maybe we use it when it's too late uh, to wait, when it's too late to see some benefit probably, but is it is early is beneficial? Uh, I don't know. Yes, I agree with you, Dr. Khan. Yani, uh, I think the group of uh, bi-level mechanical ventilation, whatever inverse ratio or bi-level or ABRV, the same concept. Uh, I really, if you remember, Dr. Khan, with the beyond the basic mechanical ventilation, the Chinese, we have it. They are, they are they like this, this type of moods. But really, yes. as you have mentioned, yani, you have to be expert enough to deal with bi-level, whatever the name, inverse ratio or bi-level or ABRV, one of them, uh, to have a good benefit from that. Some some people they use the bi level even for a routine post operative cases. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, uh, they thought that this is a good way to to wean the patient uh, quickly from mechanical ventilation because if you are if because those patients they have normal lungs, so your pressure will not be high, and when they start breathing spontaneously, they help and they will not fight, and then you can wean them quickly. But it is different from a patient with ARDS with very stiff lung. And yes. what makes things difficult and, and the most of the difficulty I found with when the patient has hypercapnia, really, because even people, yes. when they look, they, will, they could not tolerate low, low physician, they could not tolerate seeing a very low BH and they could not control it. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the people, the fan of EBRV, they are taking the patient from, uh, from time of initiation until weaning through EBRV. <laughs> they have their own way. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Yes. Let us continue. Look at the okay. So the Thank high so frequency, much. the high frequency of selective ventilator. It was a method that we use also as a rescue therapy, and uh, let me go through it. So basically, the high selective mechanical uh, ventilation or ventilatory support it has been used more by pediatric ICU. But they are expert in it. But we used to use this one as a rescue therapy. And what we have to do, basically, the breath will be a very, let's say, if you can see here in the diagram, this is a regular respiratory breath, conventional uh, breathing. And during this period, you can see, instead of one breath, you have, let's say, uh, uh, 60 breaths within, within one second. And these breaths are short. And basically, what you do, you get the breath here, and how I get a tidal volume, it's a displacement under this part of the curve of, of the breath, and I'm maintaining a mean airway pressure. So the ventilator, I sit, if I O2, I sit a mean airway pressure, which is the bias flow of gas will flow there, inflate the lung till I reach the mean to the mean airway pressure. After inflation of the lung, the ventilator will oscillate quickly with Hertz. So Hertz is 60. Uh, oscillation uh, per, min per, per minute, uh, 60 oscillation, uh, and then you can set the hertz to two, three, four. But as you go faster, you reduce the area here, and then you reduce the tidal volume. If you would like to slow down, you increase your tidal volume, you increase your uh, CO2 uh, removal, and then you have the amplitude, which is basically the strength uh, of each oscillation. And if you use a higher amplitude, uh, and usually you sit the amplitude to, so, to see some vibration at the mid thigh of the patient. So it's like a hammer going and moving the air uh, in, into, into the lung. And as we say, if you link this to the basic principle of lung mechanics, we thought that high frequency oscillatory ventilator is a ventilator, ventilate the patient in the safe zone between the lower and upper inflection point in the uh, pressure volume curve. How gas, if I inflate the lung, how gas exchange will happen? There are different methods, uh, different things, and probably you go at your spare time, there are different side to tell you. There are different method, which is let's say bulk confection, where is more gas is uh, entertained into the alveoli by the vacuum 
left when the oxygen absorb into the cap into the capillary. So you have an alveoli contain oxygen. When the oxygen is absorbed by the capillary, there is a vacuum effect that would draw some more air. Or the bend loft, which is the gas exchange between the lung unit, which have different compliance. So you have an area alveoli with a low compliance and alveoli with a with a higher with a better compliance. So the gas will move from the lower to the a higher compliance area. Tyrer dispersion, which is the gas exchange between central rabbit uh, of oxygenated gas and the relatively oxygen poor gas at the periphery of the airways. So, or uh, coaxial flow, which is a bidirectional flow of gas uh, exists. I, I don't want to go to, do, to this uh, quickly without if I want to, to you to understand it, it, it will take time, but you can go, you will find many resources, many graphics to explain uh, how gas exchange would happen. Because if you think, okay, I'm doing rapid uh, frequency uh, oscillation uh, with mean airway pressure, and basically the air would oscillate. How I ex have a gas exchange, this is the explanation. There are more than one method of, uh, of, of, of movement of the air with this uh, high frequency uh, ventilation. Okay, uh, this table and uh, it can be, uh, sorry, this table will tell you that the, the, these methods will be different at different airways. So then the proximal airway, this is the bulk flow in the mid airway, it's bundle of Tyler dispersion, uh, asymmetrical velocity profile. In the distal airway, it's cardiogenic mixing and collateral ventilation. Because even with, uh, uh, with with AIBRB and high frequency, you can open some bridges between between the alveoli and move oxygen uh, between the alveoli. Uh, this study uh, it look at high frequency uh, oscillation early acute respiratory distress syndrome. I think this is the study of Ferguson. Uh, he have a control group. I think with the conventional mechanical ventilation, he look at. Uh, Mortality, uh, mechan death in intensive care unit, death before 28 days. And if you, if you can see here, 47% compared to 35%, 45 compared to 31, 40 compared to 29. So high frequency oscillatory ventilation have a higher mortality. Barotrauma, there is no difference. Neutric histamine, there is no difference. Refractory hypoxemia, maybe it improves oxygenation, the high frequency ventilation. Uh, and number of refractory hypoxemia is less. Death after refractory hypoxemia, 79 to 66. Uh, refractory acidosis, there is no difference, no difference in refractory barotrauma. Uh, uh, so basically it increased uh, mortality. And since then, if you look, uh, this is the high frequency, the survival, the probability of survival is much less in high frequency. And this was the death sentence of the use of high frequency ventilation. Uh, and then at the conclusion of that study of Neil Ferguson, that in adult with in adult patient with moderate to severe ARD is the early application of high frequency targeting lung recruitment as compared with ventilation strategy that use low tidal volume and high beep, and that permit high, uh, and that permits high frequency only in cases of refractory hypoxemia does not reduce mortality and may be harmful. And since then, we are not using high frequency, especially with the presence of ECMO. This is a Cochrane's library, uh, library um, uh, systematic review meta-analysis looking at high frequency ventilation. They look at different studies. And this table, just I want to illustrate for you, this is the mortality uh, here. Uh, which is with a risk uh, a relative ratio, a risk ratio, uh, a relative ratio of uh, 0 0.09 to no, uh, no difference. Mortality at six months, there is uh, uh, probably uh, no benefit of this. Let me go to the forest plot. It will illustrate it more. So in the forest plot here, mortality outcome, hospital 30 days mortality. If you look between uh, high frequency ventilation and conventional mechanical ventilation here, uh, the effect is 196, 192. So there is no benefit shown by using high frequency uh, oscillatory ventilation uh, to reduce mortality. And 
if we go again, uh, I think this is, if I'm not mistaken, this is treatment failure. Yeah, it's, it's hiding. Treatment failure. So um, uh, treatment failure, probably there is some, some tendency toward benefit favoring high frequency mechanical uh, ventilation. Uh, but again, uh, after that study of Ned Ferguson, uh, we are not using high frequency ventilation. And now if the patient has hypoxemia or severe ARDS and need rescue therapy after doing uh, what we said in terms of uh, uh, using method of low tidal volume, high beep, some recruitment maneuver, broadening positioning, uh, paralysis and reducing volume, we go with no delay for ECMO. So ECMO uh, showed probably it's a better option than high frequency ventilation, and we are not using it anymore. I think this is my last slide uh, in the talk, and I hope uh, I did cover, uh, let's say, most of the ventilatory part of management of ARDS with uh, shedding light on basic and connecting the basic uh, to the clinical uh, application, clinical trials, and we reviewed probably uh, uh, the evidence for time constraint, we could not show uh, all the evidence in detail, but if these are the points that we talk about it, and I'm happy to have uh, any uh, question to be uh, to be answered. Well, I thank you so much, Dr. Khalid. Yeah, a very comprehensive review for the ARDS, and I, I'm, I'm really happy that you mentioned the, the high frequency, especially and with the oscillation and the oscillator trial, which is almost killed the high frequency. But as you, if you remember, and almost like seven years back or eight years back, we have a, a very huge patient experience with high frequency. And our center, as you, as you know, we have a lot of devices and we did use it a lot as a rescue therapy. And even we, we, we have seen a lot of hypoxemic improving for the patient hypoxia improving, but of course, with the evidence based, uh, we can say uh, now in the in the shelf, nobody using it. Uh, apart from the neonates, of course. Uh, yeah, but I, think I the do like is, is yes. different. It's different. The pediatric and neonate, I think they are still they have some application of high frequency. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but even though any on 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 the ground on the floor, we did use it and we chose some uh, in front of eyes and some of the uh, improvement in hypoxemia for the patient as a last resort. For the patient who can who cannot improve the oxygenation by the traditional or convert or even rescue therapy, uh, but of course the evidence always uh, have superiority for the managing with the patient because it is worldwide and they are dealing with that. Uh, for the high frequency, uh, thank you so much. If you have any question for the audience, you can just put it at. You can drop your questions in the chat room. Or if, if somebody would like to talk, Madri, if you want to allow somebody, I need to use. Uh, yeah, if you'd mic. like to, Mike, Yanni, who's and can talk, you can open your mic and ask. Greatly welcome. Dr. Health, of course, Yanni, the ARDS, like any other uh, disease in the ICU, uh, especially and uh, the, uh, the most common disease in ICU and like ARDS have a lot of literature and the evidence and everything. But you agree with me uh, that the new trend about personalization or individualization to say whatever, or precision medicine for ARDS or for management, uh, any, uh, it is on the, on the floor nowadays worldwide, even not in the clinical practice, yani, because everyone has his own course, uh, figures, parameters, different language mechanics, different physiology, different parameters. Yani, uh, I am as a, a, a user, I do like even uh, to give me a numbers to follow up. Yani, for example, if you tell me, go with a tidal volume four to six to ml, I would be happy. I would be almost satisfied. If you ask me to give my plateau pressure 30, I will be happy and easy to be used, right? But if you tell me, each person has his own tidal volume, each person has his own, <laughs> Plateau, yes. of course, it would be like, uh, yani, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think, uh, I think, uh, uh, Ahmed, uh, what I say that uh, as, as a person dealing, uh, a specialist in critical care, you should look for uh, mechanical ventilation for every patient individually. 
no patient like the other. Uh, some patient, they will like higher PEEP, some patient, they don't like high PEEP. Some patient, they like a, a tidal volume uh, uh, at a higher level, because some of the recommendation, if you sit at tidal volume at six, and then the plateau pressure is than 30, you can go to a higher tidal volume, for example, seven, seven. So there are a lot of things you will not learn it, you will not test it, you will not see the benefit unless you stand tight the bit side and you play with the mechanical, but you should not play with mechanical ventilation unless you know what you are doing. Yes, I agree with you. So any, the bottom line, any, in the beginners, it is better for you to have the protocol, to have the number to follow up, but once you get experience, you can do a deal with your own personalized uh, management. This one, by the way, for all uh, disease nowadays, yani, because everyone has his, his own phenotype, everyone has his yeah. own lung mechanics, his own basic yeah. parameters, yeah. especially we are dealing yeah. with the anesthesia. So for easy, easy for the anesthetist to have a brief visit clinic uh, before he will go yeah. for OR. So you know where the baseline of the of each patient. But for ICU, unfortunately, we have the patient on a spot on the on the, yeah. on the bed. Let, right? let so we cannot know, we don't know his baseline. Let, let, let me prove Ahmed to have a short comment about this procedure. Uh, you know, for example, post-operative nausea and vomiting. Nowadays, some people search that is related to some genes, so uh, should be personalized as you want. Uh, your question, I was thinking about Dr. Khalid Al-Maghrabi in the procedure of precision medicine, and we say that the skin is not going to have a bizarre response between low tidal volume different patient ده suitable ليه ان احنا نعمل كده وده لا نعمل اللانج استراتيجي بالشكل الفلاني او الريسبوندنج احسن هل ده هيدي هيبقى جين ريليتد بعد كده هل ده ده اللي انا كنت عايزه اساله وحضرتك سالته قبل يعني uh, it could be but the, the gene related will be related to the pathogenesis and how the patient respond in terms of the pathogenesis like if you look at sepsis for example, if you look at a patient who are uh, developing septic, who is the patient, for example, have E. coli and develop sepsis, there are certain genetic abnormality related to the innate uh, immunity in these patients. So probably the pathogenesis will be different, the affection will be different. How uh, uh, we can learn from COVID. COVID, they have more of the thrombosis. I mentioned that in the ARDs, you have some thrombosis in the capillary and COVID is more. So the genetic predisposition to have more element of a disease rather than the other end one, definitely, but I don't think it is, um, I'm not aware. I'm not aware if it is studied, but I think the, the literature is, is wide to search for it. Maybe yes. the coming uh, days will solve this problem. Agreed with us. Actually, you know, as Dr. Khaled mentioned, the genotyping or let us say phenotyping or biological one from the factor of personalization. Any yeah. personalizations in the ARDS have a lot, like target tidal volume, like recruitment, like gas exchange, like uh, uh, any, uh, even the plateau pressure, uh, different for each one, right? For lung mechanics, as well as, of course, the genotyping. For the phenotype, hyperinflammatory, hypoinflammatory, one from the item of personalizations, but of course, as Dr. Hyde mentioned, still, this is the era of research for the future, I think. I think yeah. we have to have it. Yes. Uh, going back to health for the attendees, we have one question about non debridizing muscle relaxants, uh, neuromuscular blockers uh, for the, uh, uh, for the I, I ARDS think, patients. Uh, the, the latest evidence support the utilization for the first uh, uh, 72 hours. There are the study. There are some conflicting um, results. But now, as I mentioned, nobody will go, for example, for ECMO before trying muscle relaxant and proning for that. I, I, really, I don't remember the evidence, but as far as I remember, Mukid Bakrni Ahmed, you know, the, the first study showed that it is beneficial within the 72 hours. And then there is another study did not show the same significant uh, outcome. So, Ahmed? Yes, they can, uh, the mus about muscle relaxant, if I, if I got. Yes, uh, they can use the the only trash showing that is a tracheorium used for 48 hours, maybe in some patients, 24 to 48 hours, showing some uh, mortality benefit during that time. But I, I'm believing in it, and it is it, uh, because it was strict to say a tracheorium, which we, we are not using. So, still have a rooming, but I don't think so. It is not like other modalities yet. So, if you cannot ventilate the patient, you can give him, and as much as you can, to minimize the muscle relaxant in, in, in ICUs. Uh, we have debating uh, questions, but Dr. Khalid here. Dr. Yani, uh, can you can you hear me? Or? 
اي هاف كومنت يس يا هاي السلام عليكم دكتور خالد دكتور احمد يا ثانك يو فيري ماتش فور ذس كومبرنسيف برزنتيشن اند اي ثينك يو منشن اول اباوت ذا ميكانيكال انفليشن ريلي استراتيجيز بس اي جاست وونت تو اول تو كومنت ذات ذا بيشن از از ون يونت انتجريتي ذا ذا اذر فاكتورز از فيري فيري امبورتنت The, 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 the negative balance, the fluid balance, uh, CRRT, fluid removal, infection control. Um, also, this is really, really important to the management because at some point, these factors they contribute more and is very harmful. I remember like septic patients, when they start the fluid resuscitation, uh, usually the, this reflects definitely on the lungs. But soon, the next day, 24, 48 hours, they will be flooded with uh, with fluids and then the air, air this happened after the sepsis because of this. I remember uh, yani we, 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 we used to give fluids and then the next day patient go into RDS, we give lasers. So uh, this is, has to be in the, the context of the management of these patients is very, very important. Uh, the same as you mentioned, well, the well, body weight. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, we also have, uh, as I said, initially you need to have the alveoli stinted with air. So if you can't yeah. reduce the amount of fluid, so it's the same principle. So dry lungs yeah. are happy lungs. We do, we do okay, yeah. but, but the things that this, I want to This is what Intensivist is always saying, Dr. Khaled, but nephrologists, they have another, huh? Yeah, but <laughs> this is, I, yes. I, I wanted only to talk about uh, mechanical ventilatory management, uh, yeah, that's uh, what, not yeah. the other thing. Yeah, sure. yeah exactly, yes. yeah. So one thing also you mentioned the ideal body weight is very important, and also yes. the looking at the the background of the patient is very also important because I mean if you are ventilating a patient who is like restrictive lung disease before lung fibrosis, it's different than COBD and different. So this is also like the background of the patient is very important. Yes, uh, and yes, yeah, and uh, also I don't know if we can label patients who are long-term ventilated, uh, when they become more sick, more hypoxic, is it you, you treat them the same as ARDS if they become uh, sick and hypoxic or any infection on top? Because uh, sometimes this long-term patients are really challenging. You, you mentioned about tracheostomy patient and <laughs> even you, you mentioned about maybe browning them. So uh, because I, I have some patients like uh, we have a lot, some of these patients in our ICU and they get worse and come back and forth from LTC long-term to our ICU. I, I don't think it's the basophysiology also the same as a healthy lung pneumonia, new COVID. Well, well, but I, I, definitely, I mean, if you have a patient with interstitial lung disease and you don't know what you are doing. So what we talk about from the basic uh, science how the lung will be distributed, how the alveoli, there is more complex a complex situation. But in general, in general, what has been proven with no doubt, the injury to the alveoli, the villi is there, whatever is the pathogenesis. Mm -hmm. So if you can ventilate your patient with lower pressure, if you can ventilate patient safely keeping the plateau pressure, which is we think it is the pressure reflecting the pressure in the alveoli, Definitely, you do better for anyone. Normal lung. Mm. Uh, yes. uh, uh, so I think low tidal volume. The guidelines for low tidal volume. Basically, it, it is not going to harm the nor the diseased part of the alveoli. It may increase the injury. So it injured the alveoli, which is the normal alveoli and the abnormal alveoli. You can induce lung injury in normal people with a very high pressures. Because as we said, you have the barotrauma before you go to a clear uh, alveolitis or a clear ERDS. So I am a believer and a strong recommender that use the lowest pressure in patients. Even if the patient mm. has normal lung, use the lowest pressure. Higher pressure, it may damage the alveoli. And as I said, you have to individualize. If you have a patient, for example, uh, with interstitial lung, it is one among the things that will be really uh, difficult to, to, to work and predict. Again, personalization. You sit beside the patient, you see what you can do, how you reduce the harm to start with, 
how you get a reasonable gas exchange and you take it from there. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, that's uh, clear. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Asha. Thank you, Dr. Asha. Thank you, Dr. Asha. Thank you. We still have... I, I have, have a comment, the... a bit of a question. Maybe I'll comment. I suppose that part of the artificial intelligence will enter us in the same area. And after that, when I put the data of the eye, and I suspect that there is good prognosis or not, on the basis of the pressure, on the basis of the pathology that is present, on the basis of the comorbidity, on the basis of the position that I put field ventilator. Dr. Khalid, do you suppose that artificial intelligence in, and machine learning will have a role in management of ARDS in the coming uh, few months or uh, uh, years? Yes, what, what I can uh, tell you, um, if you look now uh, uh, at artificial intelligence in critical care medicine, among the things that artificial intelligence using basically data from previous patients and what it can be used to predict patients who's going to be worse or patient will have a better or worse outcome. So yes. probably predicting who's the patient going in the wrong way, artificial intelligence, I think it will it will have a part and you will see it in the future. In predicting who, how the patient will behave. Is the patient going to improve or not? Is the patient going to collapse? Is the patient going to respond? And yes. basically dealing with the data uh, from the patient and for the system. I think uh, for my limited knowledge, I will not be surprised that it, it will play a major role in the future. Sure, Dr. Asafa, Dr. Khaled, I think uh, you, uh, this is the future. <laughs> will be uh, the human, they will have nothing to do. But <laughs> no, you have, uh, they will not, they will not discuss. Don't worry, don't worry. Yeah, no, an anesthesiologist or intensiveness. <laughs> but yani, I think in our clinic, that's even the trust. If you go back to the our smart moods, yani, this, we still have some some of the uh, uh, device which can play some role. You are just giving the uh, seated minute ventilation, and they can adjust the rate. They can adjust the, of course, adaptive and the, most of the smart moods now playing the role of uh, some some of that. But, uh, they try to I overcome uh, the, the, they try by the artificial intelligence, they try to overcome some cognitive dysfunction uh, because of our busy or because of our expanding our effort. So they uh, want to do uh, this artificial intelligence to overcome this point. On, yes. And we no. will not succeed. <laughs> Human errors, I agree with you. Yeah. I think yeah. we have a question for, uh, for, for the steroids. This is, I think, the very debating and long questions. For the steroids in ARDS, uh, Dr. Abdullah asking. Any, uh, I think uh, 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 there, there is, uh, till now, the evidence of a steroid um, is not supported. And um, in my practice, I don't practice. But as long as Maduri is still alive, we can see more trials for steroid. Uh, yes. to be used. Uh, but, but we uh, did agree for the high dose, there is no place, right, Dr. Khalid? But yeah, for the small dose, still debating. This is still debating. So there is strong yes. debate and uh, I don't know, I, I'm not using it uh, in, in my practice, my colleague in my hospital, we are not using it. And probably- Lori and Anani and a lot of uh, fans of the steroids and others against. There is, there is a recent study for, uh, there is a recent study uh, for Midori looking at sepsis with uh, with the steroid, but it was negative yes. again. Yes, yeah, so a lot of conflicting, but at least yeah, the high dose nobody using it. Uh, there is very experienced Dr. Khaled, yani from also admin, the question about uh, extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal. Yani, you know, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm really witness of the Saudi Arabia experience for the ECMO. Uh, yani they have a lot of yani, uh, achievements for the ECMO and uh, about extracorporeal carbon dioxide. Do you have any data to share about it for the patient who is uh, I, I, well, I don't, I don't have data. You know that extracorporeal CO2 uh, uh, removal, there are more than one method that can be done. One of them through the ECMO machines, uh, similar to the ECMO machine using uh, basically smaller cannulas, smaller flow and uh, different, uh, different uh, oxygenator or CO2 removal, uh, which is expensive. People, they use what they call the Nova Lung, which is basically you hook uh, uh, the CO2 removal, uh, let's say filter uh, without, without machine uh, between uh, an artery and vein of, of, of the patient or to use something uh, through a dialysis catheter. Uh, the experience is not huge. Uh, I think patient population will determine this, but um, for myself, 
I don't have experience uh, for myself. When I was chairman of the department, we got two of the Nova Lung, but they expired before we used them. And they are quite expensive. Yes. Uh, another last question, I think, about timing of ECMO. Of course, this is yani, uh, it is not one from the uh, rationale of objective, but uh, the best okay. time for ECMO to be effective? Uh, the ECMO will be effective. Yes. Definitely, at any at any time, ECMO is effective. But it when is the time you catch the lung for a possibility of recovery? This is the issue. So the ECMO is effective in any time, but you would like to support the lung which has some reversibility. So that means you go early in these lungs. Let's say uh, the patient should be should not be on. Uh, harmful mechanical ventilation, or you are not able to do protective lung strategy just for, let's say, few, let's say, less than a day. If the patient in maximum, you paralyze the patient, you prone the patient, and then it's not improving, you should not wait longer because ECMO, the patient will be fine on ECMO, definitely. You will have beautiful number, beautiful oxygenation, but the lung recovery is the, the issue. So, uh, uh, patients should not be long time. On what's the long time? We're talking about for 24 to 72 hours maximum. Uh, I think we would agree. Yeah, and the protocol of ECMO in Saudi Arabia is very clear, right? You have specific objective uh, parameters to be uh, activated the ECMO. Even the ECMO team, when they activated, they advise to go through the protective strategy to the recruitment to the, uh, uh, but within certain time. Yani, uh, first go with the, uh, talk about ARDS ECMO. Uh, yani, uh, ABRB, uh, sorry, uh, broning recruitment within short time if failed, they are taking the patient for ECMO. Uh, I think. Okay, I think we, we have covered the question for the ECMO. Any other yes. uh, question or comment? I don't think so. In the chat room, I think is empty with a lot of thanks. So I'd like actually to thank you, Dr. Khaled, a lot so much for very, very comprehensive review. And uh, I'm really refresh all of our uh, memo about the ARDS from A to Z. Thank you so much, Dr. Khaled. Uh, floor yeah. is yours, Dr. Safar, and thank you so much. Okay, okay. so proud and so grateful uh, for Dr. Khaled Maghrabi really no enough words can express my feeling and appreciation. Uh, we spent about two hours. We have even no one minute to attention distraction. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. Exactly as long as the time passed, we are more attention and we more concentrated with you. Every word in your lecture leave a deep print in our experience and, and, and our uh, daily practice, of course, we have a very valuable uh, and comprehensive lecture. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. Really, and lastly, Dr. Khalid, it is my great pleasure and appreciation for your valuable time and effort. Many thanks, and please repeat this uh, chance for us again, please. Thank you uh, for inviting me, and inshallah, I yani, Everybody really, you are an amazing moderator. You manage this uh, heavy meal uh, uh, session uh, cleverly and promptly. Many thanks for your valuable time and effort. And if we have a chance to have you, and really it is a good surprise for me firstly and for all my attendees that you will be with us uh, the last Friday in uh, sweet, uh, sweet November. Uh, we are waiting for you, Dr. Ahmed, and many thanks, many thanks for your valuable time and effort, uh, both of you. And uh, I know that it's يعني زي ما انا قلت في البوست ان السيشن دي هتبقى علامه وعلامه من اثنين علامه فشكرا جزيلا لحضرتك دكتور خالد شكرا جزيلا دكتور احمد وان شاء الله ان شاء الله تنعاد علينا كلنا الايام بخير شكرا, 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 شكرا لكل الاتندي شكرا لكل الاتندي شكرا لحضرتك يا فندم معلش تعبنا حضرتك اسبوع على خير شكرا لحضرتك شكرا يا دكتور احمد شكرا جزيلا شكرا شكرا شكرا